Amen. Chapter 1, verse 6. Michelle, you want to check to make sure the internet? Praise the Lord. John, 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 6. When you have it, you can either stand or just say amen so I know everybody is ready. Amen. We welcome those that may be watching live by internet or may watch this archive later. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 1 starting in verse 6. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the Bible reads, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Now, uh, jump over to chapter 2, verse 13, very quickly. It says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. And I'll stop right there. True fellowship. True fellowship. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and... Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, help me with this message this morning, Lord. Lord, let the real teacher and preacher come forth, Lord. And Lord, in my weakness, Lord, I ask that you become strong, Lord. Give me boldness, Lord, and anoint your people to hear and understand this morning. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. First of all, before I get into the heart of this message here, starting in verse 6, I want to jump back over to chapter 2, amen, verse 13. I'm going to read that once again. He says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father." In other words, what I'm saying this morning, amen, first of all, this whole Bible, this whole um, book, this about the blood of Jesus, it all has to pertain on how to deal with sin, amen. This is why this book was written, amen, because man had fallen, amen, to sin consciousness, amen, and God wanted to show humanity what the answer was, and he writes, uh, has the the Bible written, amen, so man may know the answer uh, to sin, amen, which is the blood of Jesus, And it doesn't matter whether you're a father, it doesn't matter whether you're a young man, or it doesn't matter whether you're a little child, amen. It's still the answer for every single person. You have to understand, when uh, when John wrote this, John the Beloved, the spiritual implication was, he was saying, I write unto you fathers, amen. Now, that word fathers, he's not meaning fathers as in Catholicism and priests, That's not what he's meaning. But he's meaning those who have become spiritually mature in Christ, amen, and are dependent on him in everything. He writes to those who he calls young men, young men and women, amen, who have maybe just started to understand the message of the cross and are now starting to apply it in their own lives, amen, and are learning how to overcome the evil one and sin, amen. 
And then he writes on and tells, this message is also for you, little children, those who are still babes in Christ. He's not talking about three or four year olds, amen, but he's talking about those who may be new converts, amen, or those who may just understand salvation and that's it and they're still babes in Christ, amen. But the point I'm trying to get across this morning, amen, when John wrote this, he's pointing it back to the blood of Jesus and that it has to deal, and it's, the whole reason is, it is to deal with sin. It doesn't matter whether you're a father, it doesn't matter whether you're a young man, who's learning to overcome the evil one or it doesn't matter whether you're a babe in Christ the answer is still the same the problem is still the same and the answer is still the same the problem is sin and the answer is the blood I said the problem of all humanity is sin and the answer is the blood of Jesus amen and he points out in chapter 2, verse 13, I don't care whether you think you're spiritually mature, I don't care whether you think you know the message of the cross now, and you're starting to learn how to have victory, or I don't care whether you're a babe of Christ, this applies to you. Because the problem has always been, and always will be, sin. And the answer for it always has been, and always will be, the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so John, he writes here what the problem is. And the reason he writes it is so that whether they be young men or whether they be uh, spiritually mature, amen, or whether they be uh, babes in Christ, he wants to tell them so that their joy may be full, what the problem is and what the answer to the solution is. Amen. And as we see, so that their joy may be full, he deals with the aspect here in chapter 1 about the problem is always sin. Amen. No matter which way you want to look at it, the problem is always sin. And he breaks it down into three different groups here. Amen. First of all, he's talking to the fathers, he's talking to the young men, and he's talking to the um, little children. He says, uh, at first here in chapter 1 here, he, he tells them that so that their joy may be full. In the first part he says in verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, I don't care whether you uh, think you're spiritually mature, I don't care whether you think you're a young man or young woman and you know the message of the cross, or whether you're a new convert, a babe in Christ. First of all, he tells them, all three of them, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lying. Amen. Amen. Why? Because when we walk in sin, when we walk in dark, uh, darkness, it always frustrates grace. Always. Amen. And disrupts our fellowship with God because God is apart from sin and he wants nothing to do with it. And so this first part, he writes to those who may be practicing antinomianism or the worldly church, amen, or hyper grace that we have been seeing in the last year or so coming about. And so first he goes to that group and says, now listen here. It's always been about dealing with sin. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. It's not so you can have a license to sin and go out and do whatever you want and fulfill the lust of the flesh. I believe he told the church in uh, Galatia, he said, don't use your liberty for an occasion to fulfill the flesh. Amen. And so this first part, he deals with uh, those who may be practicing antinomianism or hyper grace or what we like to call the worldly church. And he says, no, no, no. It's not the uh, grace isn't the idea, so you may have a license to sin. Because he says, if you're claiming to have fellowship with him, oh, I know the message of the cross, so I've got a head knowledge of it. But yet you're walking in darkness, you're lying. That's right. yes. You're lying. Yes. And he says, and do not the truth. In other words, they know the truth. They have been told the truth, but yet they're using it as a license to sin, and they're walking in darkness, amen, walking in sin, and the truth that they know is not working in them. They may know it, but it's not working in them. They do not the truth. That truth, that grace isn't flowing and freeing them from sin because they're walking in darkness, Antinomianism. Oh, well, I've, I've got a license to sin. Well, I'm under grace, so I can go do whatever I want. No, that's not the idea. That's not the idea of grace that you may uh, have a license to sin or stay in sin. Grace is to save you from sin. 
That's what grace does. What the law couldn't do, grace can do. The law couldn't save you. The law had no power to change you. The law could not deliver you. All the law could do was show you what you really are. But thank God we're under a new covenant with better promises. And under grace we can have the power of the Holy Spirit because Christ has paid for not only to... um, So that we could be free from it. Have victory over it. Walk in the light. So we can walk with our Lord. Talk with our Lord. Not just on Sunday. Just not on Wednesday. Just not on Thursday. But every single day. Taking up our cross daily and following Him. Amen. And if we are in the light and He is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. But if you're claiming to know the message of the cross and you may know it. But yet you'd rather choose to walk in sin and not allow that grace to change you, to mold you, to give you victory over whatever bondage you're dealing with. You're lying. John says it clearly. He says if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we're walking in darkness, we're lying. And the truth that you know is not doing anything for you. Amen. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, Paul addresses the question, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! God forbid! Can we continue walking in darkness so grace may abound because we're under grace? God forbid! That's not the idea. The idea is so that that power, that grace, amen, may flow uninterrupted in our lives and free us from whatever we're struggling. Yes, it may not be an overnight thing, amen. There are some bondages that just seem to fall off, but there are some you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. And as you fight it on a daily basis, denying yourself, taking up the cross and following Him, you'll see more of sin diminishing, more of self diminishing, and you'll see more fruit of the Spirit coming out. You'll see more victory in your life, and you'll see more Christ-likeness. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, amen. Glory to God. I know we're under grace, but that doesn't give us a license to sin. It doesn't give us a license to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, Paul addresses the church at Corinth. He says, well, yes, all things are lawful. Not everything is expedient. In other words, we're under grace, but just because we're under grace doesn't mean everything that you can go out and do is good for you. Doesn't mean it's spiritually good for you. Amen. Oh, yes, we're under grace, church. But that doesn't give us a license to sin. It doesn't give us a, a license to appease the flesh. And Paul himself uh, writes to the church of Corinth that says, While all things are lawful, yes, we are under grace. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. But that doesn't mean everything is good to your edification. That's right. Amen. He says uh, to the letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. Hallelujah. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he who believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Just because we're under grace, amen, we shouldn't yoke ourselves with the things of this world, amen. For what fellowship has light with darkness? Amen. Amen. In 1 John chapter 2, amen, in verses 15 to 16, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. The things that appeal to the flesh are not of God. Amen. I'm sorry, those churches who may be using fog machines, strobe lights, food, whatever. It's not of God. The world cannot win over the world. Amen. Oh, we're under grace. Yes, we are. Amen. But light and dark can't fellowship. Amen. The things of God and the carnal things of the world are at enmity with one another. Amen. They can't combine. It doesn't work that way. The world cannot win over the world. Amen. And at the same time, we can't just stay in our sins and be content, amen, saying, well, I'm under grace. No, God wants to bring you out of it. He wants to grow you in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. He just doesn't want you to have a head knowledge of it. Because if you're saying, oh, well, I already know the message of the cross, yet you're not seeking deliverance, you're not seeking to be free, you're just content where you are, you're lukewarm and you're lying. And the truth is not doing what it's supposed to do in you. You know the truth. It's there. But it's dead. It's not doing you no good. Amen. James called it dead faith. Dead faith. You know the truth. You have it. But if you're continuing to walk in sin and ignoring the conviction, your conscience is getting seared. You're growing numb to the conviction now. You're content because you're saying, well, I'm under grace, but yet I know the message. You're lying. And the truth is not doing what it wants to do in you. And your faith is dead. It's doing you no good. It's doing you no good. Because you're not seeing the proof, the works. Not the spiritual discipline kind of works, amen. But the works of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is not coming about, amen. Amen. And your faith is doing you no good. No good. It's dead. It's worthless. That's the first group he comes to. Amen. And talks to about. I don't care whether you think you're spiritually mature. I don't care whether you think you're a young man or young woman in the spiritual sense and know the message of the cross. I don't care if you're a little babe being tossed to or fro, sucking on milk. Amen. He's saying if you're walking in darkness, yet claiming to know the message, and the truth isn't working in you, you're lying. That's the first group he points out. That's what it is uh, to be antinomianism or the hyper grace, amen, or the worldly church where they claim to uh, know the message. They claim to proclaim it, amen, but there's no fruit of the Spirit, amen. There's no growing in the grace and knowledge. There's no victory over sin. And what we're really doing is lying to ourselves, And God's not doing what he wants to do because we do not the truth. We're not allowing that truth to work in us, to change us and mold us and deliver us and free us. And the result, amen, is that our faith will be dead. The result, that sin will eat away and tear away at our faith little by little, piece by piece, until there's nothing left. That sin, walking in that darkness, is going to cut our lives short. That's what Paul was really talking about, the spiritual implication in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, when he talks about the Lord's Supper. If you're not discerning the body correctly, you're not discerning the blood of Jesus correctly, you're using it as a license to sin. And you're walking in darkness, and what you're really doing is cutting your life short. Because that's what sin does. It eats away at our faith and it cuts our life short because sin always brings death. That's why so many Christians, uh, he said, are asleep, amen, and are sickly because they're using it as a license to sin and what is happening is that sin is cutting their life short and because of it, sin is working in them instead of the truth working in them and many are sickly and many have died before their time because of it, amen. And instead of grace coming about in their life, the wrath of God is coming down upon them. You have to understand, amen, 
the judgment of God is either going to come down on two places, the sacrifice or the sacrificer. Amen. That's the only two places it can come about. Amen. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed to those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. If you're holding that truth, you know it, but you're holding it in unrighteousness. Grace is not coming down, but instead the exact opposite. The wrath of God revealed from heaven is coming down upon you. That's why things get worse. That's why things, I can't understand why God isn't doing this or doing that. Because you're holding the truth in unrighteousness and the wrath of God is coming down instead of the grace of God flowing in your life. That's the first group, amen. I know this is more of a teaching than a preaching this morning, amen. I'm teaching it like a preaching, but... <laughs> or preaching it like a te- amen. But you get the idea, amen. And this doesn't apply just for, oh, this person, that person, or you on camera, or me. This applies for everybody, because he writes it and says, if you're a father, I'm writing this to you. Yeah. Now, not Catholicism, father, amen, but one who is mature in Christ, Amen. He says, I'm writing it on to you. I'm writing it on to you, young men and women. That doesn't mean people from 18 to 35. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those who are, uh, have heard the message of the cross and are learning it and are in training and, le- and applying it every day and learning how to get victory. This applies to you. And he says, I'm writing this on to little children. That doesn't mean children from six-year-olds to 18. That's not what he's meaning. What he's meaning is those who are new converts or babes in Christ. So it doesn't matter whether you're spiritual mature. It doesn't matter whether you're learning. Or it doesn't matter whether you're a new convert. This is for you. And this is what the Lord wanted us to know. Amen. Amen. That we can't hold it in unrighteousness. And do what we want to do and walk in sin. He says, because you don't have fellowship. You're lying. Amen. He goes on to the next group. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we don't understand the sin nature, because that word sin is a noun there and you can have the definite article. So if we say we uh, have no the sin, in other words, we don't we don't agree that we have a sin nature, we don't understand it, then we deceive ourselves And the truth is not in us. Amen. Now listen. Many Christians have truths. Amen. Many Christians have truths. And when I mean truths, amen, the Holy Spirit is constantly writing on our heart. Amen. The laws of God. So many Christians have truths. Amen. They know they should pray. Amen. The Lord's dealt with them. You need to be in church. The Lord deals with them. You need to uh, read your word. Amen. There's truth there. But they don't understand the truth on how to be free. And this is the group he deals with next. There are many Christians who have truths in the word of God. Amen. Which is written on their heart because that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. They're writing God's laws on their heart. Amen. But the problem is they don't understand the truth on how to be free from sin. And are using other things to try to have victory over sin and are failing. And this is what we call Galatianism. Where they get saved by faith, but then they use other things. Why? Because they don't understand the truth. And this is the next group John writes to. It can either mean those who claim that they don't have a sin nature, but it can also mean those who don't understand the truth. While they have truths, amen, Like a strong prayer life, amen. Getting water baptized, those are truths. But those in themselves won't make you free. It's not the truth. Do do you understand that? There's a difference between truths, what the Word of God claims we should do, and the truth that will make you free. And there's many Christians who understand truths of the Bible. I need to be water baptized when I get saved. I need to have a strong prayer life. I need to read the Word of God. These things are good, but they don't set you free in themselves. The only thing that could set you free is the blood of Jesus and knowing and understanding that truth. 
And this is the second group John deals with. I don't care whether you call yourself spiritually mature. I don't care whether you call yourself a young man or a young woman. Or if you're a little baby. You need to understand this. If you don't understand how the blood of Jesus sets uh, men free for sanctification, you're deceiving yourself, thinking you could do it on your own. And the truth is not in you. He didn't say the word of God wasn't in him. He said the truth is not in us. It's not talking about truth that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ isn't in their heart. Amen. But what it does mean is that truth, that knowledge that can set them free. They don't understand it. And so it's not there. And they don't understand how the sin nature works. Amen. And they're struggling. And they're really in a Romans 7. Amen. They're in a Romans 7. Amen. Well, how do you know that, Brother Brad? Because he's, the way, what he writes, he's writing to believers. In chapter 2, verse 13, he's writing to believers. He's writing to fathers, those who are spiritually mature. He's writing to young men and young women, meaning those who are learning how to apply the blood. And he's writing to little children, those who are babes in Christ, new converts. And he's telling them in the second group, he says, if you don't understand the sin nature and how it operates and how it works, you're deceiving yourself and you don't really understand the truth. You may understand truths like spiritual disciplines, water baptism. You may even understand the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But you don't understand the truth that will set you free. The same faith that saved you is the same faith that keeps you. And hallelujah, it's the same faith that will free you from sin. Because you have to understand. Self can't give you victory over sin. Many Christians are deceived thinking, just as John said, they're deceived. Many Christians think that they can get victory over sin if they just try hard, work hard, get professional help now is the new motto. Amen. But it won't work. You're deceiving yourself if you think you can do it. Amen. If you could do it, then Christ died in vain for nothing. Because if you could sanctify yourself, you could get to the point where you could save yourself. Well, then what in the world was the point of Jesus Christ coming down here for and die on a cross? That's what he was telling the churches in Galatia. He says, are you so foolish thinking you've begun in the Spirit? Now you can do it by the flesh? You're deceived. You can't. Jeremiah said best. Amen. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? No. Can a leopard change his colors of his spots? No. Self cannot change self. Amen. I'll say it again. Self cannot change self. No matter what you do, you're never going to be able to get the victory yourself. Amen. You need that. You can't get it out by spiritual disciplines, amen. You can't get it out by psychology. You can't get it out by self. The only way you can do it is faith and grace it out. I said the only thing you can do is faith and grace it out. Just believe that God has already given you a victory through his son and what he's done at Calvary and let grace do its work, amen. You have to faith and grace it out. Amen. I know it may be trying. I know it's not going to be a bed of roses. Amen. Because Paul calls it a fight. A war. Amen. It's not going to be easy. Satan's going to do everything he can to stop you from believing. He's going to try to discourage you. He's going to try to lie to you. But if you'll fight the good fight of faith, I'm telling you, there will be a day come where that sin shall not have dominion over you. It's the only way the Holy Spirit works. Yeah. Amen. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. Amen. That's the only way. It's a law. It's a spiritual law. Yeah. And how do we become in Christ Jesus? Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 24. It says, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. It says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. 
to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and a justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. It's a spiritual law, amen, that you have to apply your faith, amen, in the blood of Jesus. And verse 25, whose God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Amen. To declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are uh, past through the forbearance of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit only works in Christ. Amen. According to the law of the Spirit. Spiritual law, never going to change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We'll never change. And the only way to be in Christ according to the law of faith in Romans 3, 24, 25, and 26, amen, is that your faith be in His blood. Amen. It's a spiritual law. Never change. Amen. Amen. And if you don't understand that on how the Holy Spirit works and how the sin nature works, And what can free you from that? Well, then you're deceived and you don't understand the truth. Amen. And that's the second group Paul, or not Paul, excuse me, John writes to, John the Beloved. And the third group, well, first of all, I'm going to say this, amen. What will happen if they don't understand the truth? Amen. We we seen from the first group, if they don't allow that truth that they already know to work in them, the result is going to be sin is going to cut their life short. It's going to eat away at their faith. Uh, The wrath of God is going to come down upon them instead of the grace of God. And the truth isn't working in them and it's dead faith. That was in the first group to result. Well, what's the result of the second group if they're in bondage and they don't ever understand how the blood works for sanctification and are deceived? Amen. And don't understand the truth. This is what will happen. Number one, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, it says that they will frustrate the grace of God. Because Paul writes to Galatia and he says, For I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, he's saying if you can do it yourself, amen, if you could work it out yourself, if you could do it yourself, then Christ died for no reason. And Paul says, no, I'm not frustrating the grace of God. Amen. So if it's, if it's, I should put it this way. He says, I am crucified, yet I live. Amen. That's the key right there. Crucified. Amen. His faith is in the blood of Jesus. And he says, because of that, in the next verse in Galatians, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Amen. So we know from that, faith in the blood of Jesus, amen, allows and opens up the door for uninterrupted grace to come in and change us. And if you don't understand that, amen, if you may be in that second group, amen, well then you're deceived and you don't understand the truth. Amen. That's the first thing that will happen. Grace is frustrated. Amen. Number two, uh, Paul also said to the church of Galatia, chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. If you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Amen. Amen. In other words, grace is frustrated, and Christ ain't doing you no good. Amen. You can quote the scripture all, uh, all day long. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. But Christ isn't doing anything for you, because grace is frustrated. How can he strengthen you if grace is frustrated? You have to understand that strength that he gives you is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit only works through one way in Christ. And there's only one way to be in Christ is the blood of Jesus. And if you're not placing your faith in that, grace is frustrated. The hands of the Holy Spirit are tied. So how in the world can Christ strengthen you if grace is frustrated? If the Holy Spirit is tied, his hands are tied. The one who gives you strength and power. It's not doing you any good. It's profiting you nothing. That's what will happen if they don't understand the blood of Jesus as for sanctification. Doesn't mean they're not saved. Doesn't mean they don't love the Lord. It just means grace is frustrated. Christ isn't doing them any good. And sin is going to rule and reign in their life their entire walk if they don't understand the truth. And they will find themselves in Romans chapter 7. 
saying the exact same thing in their prayers. They're going to say, Lord, I want to do the right thing, but I don't understand how. Amen. Because the law of sin and death is warring against their mind. Amen. They're trying to fight the good battle. Amen. Their, their will is present, but they're not placing their faith in the right object because they don't understand the truth. And what is happening is the law of sin and death is warring against their mind. And Paul said it was bringing them back into captivity once again to sin. Amen. Because they don't understand the truth. Amen. They want to do what's right. They love the Lord. Their will is present. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And they find themselves doing the things they don't want to do. And the things they don't want to do, they find themselves fulfilling and doing. Because the truth is not in them. Meaning they don't understand how the blood of Jesus works for sanctification. And what happens is sin is ruling and reigning in their life. And they're living a miserable Christian walk. In frustrating grace. And Christ isn't profiting anything. Amen. I'm here to tell you, if you're in that group this morning, I got the answer. Put your faith in the blood of Jesus. Amen. There's, there's, no simple, there's no simple magic words that you say. Amen. Just every day you believe, no matter what bondage comes my way, no matter what temptation comes my way, no matter what Satan tries to throw at me, I know God's grace will see me through. Why? Because His Son has already paid it at Calvary. And just believe that on a daily basis and you shall see that sin shall not have dominion over you. It's that simple. It's that easy. Amen. Just believe in every day. God's grace will see me through because his son has already paid the price for me. And allow that truth to work in you. And if you do, it'll free you from whatever bondage. Some of it may just Come off like that, and some you may have to apply faith every day. But I guarantee you, you'll see more fruit of the Spirit coming out and more victory and less of self and sin. If you allow the blood to flow, amen, and allow the grace to flow, and allow the power of the Holy Spirit to go to work to free you from it. If not, sin will reign and rule over you the rest of your walk, amen. And you'll frustrate the grace of God, and Christ will profit you nothing. Finally, the last group Paul addresses says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen? Many Christians and churches don't want to talk about sin, address sin, and only want to hear things that will make them feel good. Thus meaning they don't know what the Word of God is really all about. And they're calling God a liar. When you go to churches that are preaching psychology saying, it's not your fault. Yes, it is. is. When you listen to a feel-good message, and there are some messages that promote blessings. Amen. We're not saying we don't, that we preach against blessings. No, we want the blessings of God. But when every single message is all about appeasing the flesh, amen, and making yourself feel good, amen. You're not addressing sin. What this whole book is about is addressing sin. And when you ignore sin, you don't preach against it, you don't talk about it, you don't tell the believer how they can be free from it, well then, you're not lying, but you're calling God a liar. Because this is the reason this book was written. Because we had fallen from uh, God consciousness 6,000 years ago. And now we're wretched sinners. And God gave us the answer how to deal with that sin. The blood of Jesus. And if you're saying, well, we don't have to address sin anymore. You're not lying. You're calling God a liar. And his word is not in you. In other words, you don't just don't understand the truth. You don't understand the word of God at all. Amen. I'll say that again. If you say we don't need to address sin anymore, we don't need to talk about sin anymore, we don't have to explain how to have victory over sin anymore, if that's what you're uh, preaching, psychology, or if that's what you're believing as a believer, then what you're really doing in the spirit world is calling God a liar that we don't have to address sin anymore, how to have victory over it anymore. You're calling him a liar. And not only do you not understand the truth, you don't understand anything about this book. Because let me tell you, 100% of this book is all about the redemption of man. In other words, how man 
can have victory over sin and how man can be, be, be forgiven from his sins. 80% of the Bible um, directs us how we can have victory over sin through sanctification. And the other 20% of the Bible talks about how we can be forgiven of our sins of salvation. I'll say that again. This whole book, 100%, was written so that man may know how to deal with sin. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. 80% of it was written so that man may know how to be free and have victory over sin, sanctification. And the other 20% of it written was that man may know how to be forgiven of those sins. In other words, salvation. But all 80 plus 20, I still believe, is 100. Amen. Amen. So 100% of this book is all about the blood of Jesus and how man can be forgiven of sin and be free from sin and walk in victory. And if you don't believe that, and if you're saying we don't have to um, uh, talk about sin anymore, we have to ignore sin and just uh, feel good messages, you not only are you lying, you're calling God a liar. Yes, that's right. Amen. And not only do you not understand the truth, well, you have no idea what this book is all about then. Amen. Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory. Every single person other than Christ Jesus has sinned. Amen. In other words, we're all doomed to hell unless we adhere to what this book says. And this book says, place your faith in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. In the Old Testament, they would say, uh, do a sacrifice, and if you believe in what that sacrifice represents, you'll be saved. And that sacrifice was a type of shadow of Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, Paul points back, you need to place your faith in the Lamb who shed His blood, which is Christ Jesus, the Son of God. So no matter which way you go, old or new, it's all pointing to the Lamb of God and Him shedding His blood for your sins. They would say, well, we don't have to talk about sins anymore. Well, then why did God give Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, to show you what we really are, sinners? That's what the whole law was about. God didn't give us the law so that we may try to keep it. We can't. We fall short of the glory every day. The law was to show us his standard of righteousness and show us how bad and ugly our righteousness really is. Amen. And again, this word that he gives us, gives us the answer to it. The blood of Jesus Christ will forgive our sins and give us victory over sins. Amen. That is good news. Praise God. The four, do you not realize the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. Amen. Think about that. Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. In other words, whenever he talked about heaven, he related it as a parable. Amen. But when it came to hell, he got down to the nitty gritty. There will be weeping. There will be gnashing of teeth. There was a man, a rich man. He went down there, amen. He's still crying to this day. Somebody come back. uh, Send somebody back to tell my brothers and sisters. He went in depth about what hell was like. But yet when it came to heaven, he just did a parable. But when it came to hell, he told, he got down to the nitty gritty. Amen. And he preached more on that than he did heaven. Amen. Just as I said, he gives the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And we know it's a true story because he used a real name, Lazarus. It was not a parable. Well, why did he use the word rich man instead of giving his real name? Because out of respect for that family... Amen. If you had a loved one die and Jesus was here physically, I don't think you would want to hear that your loved one is down in hell suffering. And so out of respect for the family, he said there was a rich man. Amen. But yet it was a true story. And he got down to the nitty gritty telling what hell was really like. Amen. He said there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when it came to heaven, when it came to heaven, Most of his teachings, amen, was parables. I believe there was probably only one thing he said about heaven. I I may be wrong, but he said, I'm preparing a mansion. That's about the only thing in heaven he described for us, amen. The rest was in parables. I could be wrong, don't quote me on that, amen. But when it came to hell, he was very descriptive. 
Amen. So don't, you can't sit here and tell me that we have to ignore sin, that we have to just forget about it and just uh, pretend it never existed. Amen. Because what you're doing is calling God a liar. Amen. And you don't even know what this word is all about then. Amen. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus started out his ministry and said he started preaching, you know what the very first word that the Bible records when he first started preaching? Repent. Amen. Let's turn to that. I want to show you this very quickly. I'm, I'm almost done, church. Amen. Just bear with me a little longer. Amen. Bear ye one another's burdens. <laughs> Shouldn't really be a, pre- a burden, the preaching of the cross. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. This is after uh, John the Baptist um, is killed and then Jesus starts his ministry after he got um, baptized in the Jordan River, got filled with the Holy Ghost, and then John the Baptist got through in prison and then John the Baptist got beheaded and it says Jesus started his ministry. And in verse 17, we see how he started out his ministry. Matthew four seventeen it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say... Repent. Amen. So in other words, if God's, if Jesus Christ himself's ministry, his preaching, started out with dealing with sin, repent, how much more should the church today be dealing with sin and give them the answer, the blood of Jesus? Amen. And if you, and if you, and if you disagree with that, then what you're really doing is calling God a liar and you don't understand his word at all. Not only do you not understand the truth of the blood of how it frees us from sin, but you don't understand anything of the word then. Because this whole book is about dealing with sin through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And again, these are churches and preachers and teachers that are pretty much promoting psychology. This is the psychological church that John is writing to. I don't care whether you call yourself mature. I don't care whether you call yourself a young man or woman who is learning to overcome or if you're a babe in Christ. Because he addresses all, in verse 13 of 1 John, he addresses all three groups. Amen. And he says if you're doing antinomianism, using grace as a license to sin, well, you're lying. And the truth that you know is not working in you and it's dead faith. He says, if you're in bondage, amen, and you're, and you're trying all these other fads or trying this and that or this discipline or that discipline, amen, well, then you're deceived and you don't understand what the blood of Jesus can really do for you. Doesn't mean you don't love the Lord. Doesn't mean you're not saved. For the will is present. And in the inward man, you want to serve God's laws. But the problem is you just don't understand the truth as for sanctification and you're stuck in bondage. Just put your faith in the blood of Jesus and he'll go to work and free you. Amen. And the third group, if if you're in psychology, hearing feel-good messages, amen, and not dealing with the issue at hand, which which is and always has been sin, well, then you're in the third group and what you're doing is calling God and his word a lie and you don't understand the word at all. Amen. And what will happen is, in that third group, amen, which I really uh, look at, I know part of that in 1 John is talking about those who claim sinless perfection. But there's another part who is dealing with psychology, those who just give feel-good messages and don't want to deal with sin. And you know what's going to happen? He told Timothy in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. In his second letter to Timothy, he says there's going to preach the word because there's going to be some that don't want to hear sound doctrine anymore because they're in this third group. They're calling God's word and him a liar and they don't want to hear about sin anymore. Amen. Being turned on to fables and feel good messages. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And what, what else will happen is they'll preach another gospel and many will die lost amen 
and many will die lost, amen, because they're preaching and listening to another gospel, which is really another gospel, another Jesus, and another spirit. Well, why will they die lost? Because they're going to de- because some will depart from the faith, amen, and when you depart from the cross, there is no other answer, amen, willful ignorance, there is no more sacrifice for. If you leave the blood of Jesus willingly, because you don't want to hear about sin anymore, amen, I believe it was what in Hebrews, he says there is no more sacrifice. There's nothing else. We don't have anything else to fall back on. Amen. There is no other option. It's the blood of Jesus and that alone. Amen. And he writes this letter. Does he write it to condemn them? No. He writes it so that their joy may be full. He writes it so that they may have a relationship and be able to walk and talk with the Master just like how John the Beloved did. Amen. He didn't write it to condemn them saying, oh, you, 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 and we're all. He said, no, no, no. He says, I want your joy to be full. I want you to have a relationship like I had. Amen. I want you to understand that you have to understand sin, amen, and how to have victory over it. And he's saying, if you're using it as a license of sin, don't do that. Because you're lying. You're walking in darkness. How can dark and light fellowship? He says, but if you place your faith in him and what he's done, you'll be in the light. And if he's in the light, you'll have fellowship one with another. And that's true fellowship. And he says, well, if you're in bondage and you're trying all these other things, you're deceived. Don't do that. Because you're not understanding the truth. The truth is the blood of Jesus. And then he says to those, amen, the third group, he says, no, no, no. If you're, if you're not dealing with the sin problem, you're not understanding what the Word of God is all about. You can do all the disciplines you want. You can study all you want, but you're not understanding the whole book. Isn't that what Jesus told the religious leaders? You think you have life, Amen. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, but really they speak of me. And how you can be forgiven from sin and be free from it. And John was saying, I want your joy to be full. I want you to walk in the freedom and in the light and walk and talk with the Lord just as I've done in my walk. And he's pointing out the three errors here to the young children, to the young men and women, and also to the spiritual uh, fathers, the mature Christians. And he's saying, I want your joy to be full. I want you to be able to walk and talk with the Lord. Amen. And he says, first of all, if you're going into antinomianism and and using it as a license to sin, you may know the truth, but it's not doing you any good. And your faith is dead because you're walking in darkness and you're lying. Don't do that. Allow that truth to work in you and change you. And if you do that, you'll be in the light. He's already in the light. And you'll have fellowship one with another. If you're in bondage, amen, and you don't understand how to be free, I know you love the Lord, and despite all your efforts, you're deceived. Don't do that. Place your faith in the one who has died for you and just believe he'll give you victory and the grace will start flowing and free you. If you're in the group that says we don't have to deal with sin anymore, we just want to feel good, John says don't do that. I want your joy to be full. You don't understand what this word is saying. This whole word is addressing sin by the blood of Jesus. Place your faith in that so your joy may be full. Amen. And he's telling us, you, and you on camera. Doesn't matter which group you're in, the answer is always the same. Doesn't matter whether you're a a spiritual father in the spiritual sense, mature Christian, the answer is the same. It doesn't matter whether you're a young man or woman uh, just coming into the message of the cross. The answer is the same. It doesn't matter whether you're a new convert. You've been saved five minutes or a babe in Christ been being tossed to and fro. The answer is still the same. The blood of Jesus. Amen. And it's the only answer we got. Place your faith in that. Allow the Holy Spirit to go to work so grace may be uninterrupted and flow in your life. And not only be forgiven from your sins and taken away, but have victory over it so it will never reign and rule in your life again. So that your joy may be full. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand? Praise the Lord. True fellowship. True fellowship. Allowing the blood of Jesus, faith in that, and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives with grace uninterrupted in our life so that we may walk in the light as He's in the light and have true fellowship one with another. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that this message touch hearts and lives, Lord, and let it open up the message of the cross to them, Lord, if they don't understand it or don't know how to apply it, Lord. And Lord, let them place their faith in the blood of Jesus, Lord. And even though it may be the grain of a mustard seed, Lord, it says it can remove mountains, Lord. And we ask that you remove those spiritual mountains that are in their walk, Lord. And we'll give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless all of you.